year is going to get interview uh, interviewing Steve. So go ahead, <laughs> Thomas. All right. So Steve, yes, it's it's, it's a pleasure for me to interview you. And uh, my pleasure. Yeah, we as Link uh, students usually associate your face with Link mm -hmm. uh, when we meet your little white coated character right. in the video. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then we get started at Link and we see your face in the English uh, related videos. Right. But uh, for me uh, personally, I don't really know much about your life before. Right. We heard that you were kind of in business and you were working as a diplomat. Mm -hmm. But would you talk a little bit more about this? Because I'm really interested. Okay. Well, if we're talking about my professional career, uh, I started with the Canadian government tra diplomatic trade service. So, in other words, this is sort of a diplomatic corps that works in embassies overseas to help Canadian business people to gather economic intelligence on these countries, you know, opportunities, uh, positions that the host country might be taking in some international economic conference. So that was kind of, uh, that's the nature of the job. And my first assignment was to go to Hong Kong to study Chinese because Canada was getting ready in 1968 to recognize the People's Republic of China. All right. So that's where my kind of language thing all started. And so I studied Chinese in Hong Kong and thereafter I went to Tokyo and I was at the embassy in Tokyo for four, months, for four years working in different sectors. And, and towards the end of that I was in the forest product sector. As a result of that, I was hired by a major Canadian exporter to set up their office in Tokyo. All right. So then I did that, worked with them for quite a while, and then I was hired by their largest competitor to do the same for the competitor. So I started the Tokyo office for two of the major Canadian lumber exporting companies. And then in 1987, I set up my own company uh, where we tried to develop sort of call them niche products, and you're familiar mm. with that word, uh, niche <laughs> products, products that, uh, let's say, the big industry didn't want to produce, and I had my ideas on how we could actually manufacture those products to Japanese requirements, and so that was the beginning of, of KP Wood. So I did that, and that, and that company still exists. I'm not so active in it anymore, but I spent a good, you know, whatever it was, 25 years uh, in the lumber business, traveling largely to Japan, which I really enjoyed because Japan has a wonderful wood culture, which is something that was a, a yeah, wonderful yeah. experience for me. Um, and then uh, along the way, I, I learned other languages. Uh, I got interested in languages. I think once you know that you can learn languages, you learn one and a second and a third, then you get kind of motivated. And, uh, and then, uh, and of course, my son, Mark, who uh, is getting into a long story here, but. My wife and I both speak languages. We wanted our kids to speak languages. Of course, whatever parents want, the kids resist, right? That's the nature of things. Uh, however, he uh, ended up playing professional hockey in Europe. He was in Italy, in Austria, in Switzerland, and then in Japan. Yeah, and he suddenly right. realized that actually it's useful to speak other languages. So he now speaks a number of languages, and we started Link then about 10 years ago. Switch. I'm sure every teacher feels this. If they just go into all their students, and just turn the switch, that's all they need to do. So he turned my switch, and then I just pursued uh, French, and that was a major event in my life because I then got interested in, they had this sort of new wave, you know, Nouvelle Vague movies in those days in French, and there were so many aspects of French culture that interested me, and then I ended up going to France for three years where I did my university training. So that was the one thing. The second thing was being assigned to Hong Kong to learn Chinese, because I mean, coming from a Western culture, you know, to s discover Chinese culture, like it was unbelievably uh, exotic. I was in the fortunate position that, that uh, the government um, paid for me to study. So I was earning my salary and just studying every day, which is the only time I've ever been in that situation. That's great. That's a good, good. That's a good one, yeah. Yes. So like seven hours a day I was studying Chinese. And uh, so that was the, the second major thing. By then, you know, when I went to Japan, I didn't have to basically go to school, I just, I knew then that you have to, as I always say, listen and read a lot. So I just listen, read, listen, read, and eventually my Japanese developed. And I guess the third thing was this whole link thing, which started because we'd hired a guy from China 
who had an immigrant to Vancouver. He had all his money stolen at the airport by some local gangs or something because they know that Chinese come with all their life savings, you know, in a bag around their <laughs> neck kind of thing. <laughs> Largely Chinese gangs. And uh, so we felt sorry for this guy. We said, we'll hire him. And uh, if he's good, he helps us. If he's not, and he, if he can't function, well, at least we gave him a couple of months, right? So in the end, it didn't work out that well, largely because of his English. He had this <laughs> high score in TOEIC, because they all learn how to, you know, TOEIC or yeah, TOEFL? Yeah, they all yeah, know yeah. how to write the exam, but they still can't speak the language, right? So we started developing Link, basically, for him, and uh, then we thought, hmm, this is kind of good. And then we tried to in, in, interest the, uh, the immigration department, but they were, they're, <laughs> it's a whole bureaucratic mess there. So we then changed what was originally an English language only platform into a multi-language platform. So that was the third major thing that got me involved. And since uh, I started with Link, I got, you know, I, I've learned seven languages. Like I have learned more languages in the last 10 years than at any similar period in the past. Mm. You know, the Slavic languages, Korean, Romanian and stuff. And just talk about a little and about uh, the, the future. Yes. What kind of projects do you work on? And in your future, what kind of project are you planning, uh, English, I mean, language-wise and even in general? Well, because I'm very interested, you asked this question about whether languages are going to, you know, become less important. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, we want to contribute to making language learning easier and also possibly to preserving uh, some of the minority languages. I mean. Hung Hungarian is a minority language, but it's in no danger. But the languages, the native language in, in Canada are definitely in danger. And what tends to happen is, let's say with regard to a minority language, then, okay, we're going to save Cree, which is probably the largest native language in Canada. So pretty soon you have consultants and people wanting to get government money to write grammar books. And pretty soon they spent millions of dollars and the number of speakers of a creed just declines year after year after year, no matter All it does, you create this industry of people who are going to save Cree, but in fact, you don't save Cree. And what I'm of the belief that all that is needed to save a language or to help to, to learn a language is the language. You need to get people to talk in the language. You need to describe it. You build up the kind of library that we have at Link with audio and text and you give people a way of learning from that material. So even now, like for example, I think that I'm studying Korean. I think the material that I would like in Korean isn't there. There's some very difficult podcasts that I've had to pay to transcribe. There's some very childish, call it beginner material, but there's not the in-between material. Uh, there are people doing this kind of thing. There's a person uh, when I started Polish, uh, Piotr from Poland, who's building wonderful material. I would like to get, get together with all the people who are creating interesting content, not only in sort of English, French, Chinese, which are the most, or Arabic or whatever, that are the most popular languages, but potentially in all of them, Hungarian, let's get some content, you know? And that's where I fight with Mark, because I would like to have more languages at Link, and he, from a practical point of view, he can't justify it, because we don't have enough people who would learn Hungarian. And even, you know, I managed to get Ukrainian put in there, but I'm, I wouldn't say I'm the only one, but I'm one of the few <laughs> people studying Ukrainian. So those are the, the kinds of things related mm -hmm. to language, people getting together, understanding each other, being able to access each other's culture, that kind of thing. What made you keep learning, in, uh, learning a new language? Okay. All right. Very good question. So, you know, initially mm -hmm. I learned French. Mm -hmm. And I just got turned on. I got turned on to French culture. Uh, in those days, French movies, French uh, literature, mm -hmm. things French. And as a result, I then went to France and I studied in France for three years. Uh, Chinese, I, then I started working for the Canadian government. And the Canadian government was about to recognize the People's Republic of China. And so they needed to train up people who could speak Chinese. Mm -hmm. So when I heard about this, I thought, I thought hmm, that would be fun. I would like to learn Chinese. So I actually started learning on my own. So then I went to the director of personnel and I said, I hear you're looking for someone to learn Chinese. You should choose me because I've already started on my own. So from their point of view, because 
they send someone off to learn Chinese, that person may or may not be successful, right? Mm -hmm. So if someone is already motivated enough to start on their own, then that made their decision easier, right? Mm -hmm. So so then, and of course, I, I studied, I learned Chinese, and then I went and lived in Japan. So naturally, I'm going to learn Japanese. If I live in Japan, I'm going to learn Japanese <laughs> because I have the confidence that I can learn. A lot of foreigners live in Japan and don't learn Japanese because they think it's too difficult and so forth. So, but by that time, I think as you learn languages, you learn one and a second and a third. You just have that confidence that you can learn. And so then I got just more and more interested. So I learned Japanese, and then I learned German and Spanish, and so forth. So it's just one thing, uh, you know. In anything in life, if you are successful, mm -hmm. you want to do it again. Right? Mm -hmm. That's I think the brain, if the brain f achieves success in something, mm -hmm. that makes the brain happy. Mm -hmm. So it wants to do more of the same, right? Oh. And if you don't have success, then you don't want to do it. The last question is. Um, do you have any words for people in their 20s? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'd step back to the previous uh, goal. Uh -huh. I do believe that Link helps people mm -hmm. learn languages. Yeah. So that gives me a great sense mm -hmm. of satisfaction. So mm -hmm. not only doing it for myself, and I'm a big Link user and learn a lot mm -hmm. of languages, but it helps a lot of other people. So that makes me feel good. For people in their 20s, if I think back to when I was in my mm -hmm. 20s, you can do a lot more than you think you can. Oh. And so people in their 20s should reach higher. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't, uh, don't, look at their, don't look at yourself in the mirror so much. Oh. Should I do that? Should I do this? This is no good. I'm no good. There's a, we have a lot of hesitation when we are younger. And when we get older, we realize that very often we should have gone for more. And we didn't because we weren't sure and we didn't feel confident and 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 uh, as you get older then you, there's less of those kinds of moments of doubt but my advice to younger people is boy you can you can do a lot more than you think you can <laughs> try to write something like grammar don't no. No. every time i look at the grammar rules i think i'm learning something but in fact i'm not yeah. i'm not because Next time I still get it wrong. Let's put it this way. If you have already noticed something in the language and then you see a grammar rule that explains it, then you say, oh, okay. So now it explains something that you already know. But if you don't have any experience with this, then the grammar explanation is just a waste of time. And there's complicated terms and exceptions and, and stuff. And I just, I stay away from it. Best grammar book is the smallest grammar book. Very small grammar book with a few rules and then examples. Examples are good. So I can look at examples because the grammar explanation has to have some relationship to reality. So to that extent, those um, examples are good. But the exercises, I don't like.